a few minutes past three, and uh, let's get started. Um, this is the, um, the webinar on um, comparative effectiveness research methods uh, sponsored by the Digital Methods Center, which is funded by the uh, Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research, AHRQ. Um, before we go to today's seminar, um, I wanted to bring your attention to uh, our next seminar, which is in, uh, in, uh, in January, on the 19th of January, Squeezing the Balloon, Propensity Scores and Unmeasured Covariate Balancing, uh, by John Brooks from University of Iowa. Just kind of very interested in doing a presentation also in line of trying to achieve better confounding control and what the pitfalls are there. So, um, the, the setup for today, as is usual, is that we have a speaker, and uh, we uh, expect the speaker to present for maybe you know 30, 35, 40 minutes, uh, so that we still have um, 15 to 20 minutes uh, for discussion, and uh, you can bring up um, your questions on the internet, uh, and we will read these internet questions then, or you can just speak up. You knock, basically press the button, and then uh, we'll um, give you the microphone, and you can speak. So. Um, today's speaker uh, is, is actually a team of speakers. We have Sean Tunis and Penny Moore. Both are from the Center of Medical Technology and Policy, a, an institution that is very much involved and cutting edge in the discussion around comparative effectiveness research. Um, and um, the topic today is pragmatic clinical trials. Uh, again, something that is um, gaining more and more traction in the world of comparative comparative effectiveness research, and uh, I think it's uh, any, everybody is very, very interested in hearing what Sean Tunis uh, and, and Penny um, are, are saying about this. Of course, they have published a JAMA paper a couple of years ago, uh, which also was um, raised um, lots of attention to, to this topic. So I, I can't wait to hear them, them present, and I'm very curious for the um, discussion that will follow. So thank you very much, Sean and, and Penny. So it's, it's all yours. Thanks, uh, Sebastian. Um, so it's uh, Sean Tunis and, and Penny Moore here, and we'll be uh, tag teaming a little bit. Um, and we try to keep to our time of uh, about 30 minutes or so of presentation. So it'll be going fairly quickly, and um, uh, uh, and we'll uh, try to uh, uh, so we'll listen quickly as well, and then we'll uh, uh, have plenty of time for Q and A. Um, so I just wanted to uh, mention, I don't know if people were listening to uh, NPR this morning, but it, it turns out that there's a very timely presentation on pragmatic trials because uh, the Webster Dictionary just announced that the number one word of the year for 2011 was pragmatic. Uh, they must have known about this uh, seminar. Um, interesting, the number two word of the year, I believe, was insidious. So, uh, um, maybe there's, uh, there's room for future work in insidious clinical trials, but for now we're going to stick with the uh, pragmatic clinical trials. And I'm going to just analogy a little bit. So we're going to um, basically quickly go over uh, w what are they, uh, why they needed um, to be used, and how to overcome barriers to the conduct of pragmatic clinical trials. So the, the this is the short version of the history, but the actual uh, terminology uh, of uh, pragmatic clinical trials um, and distinguishing them from their kind of uh, extreme opposite, as you will, if you will, of explanatory clinical trials. These terms were introduced uh, in 1967 by a couple of French statisticians, uh, Schwartz and Lelouch, and uh, they wrote a paper, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, Explanatory and pragmatic attitudes in therapeutic trials, and the, the kind of essential conceptual differentiation between the explanatory and pragmatic attitude towards trials. Uh, that explanatory trials are trying to seek the to estimate the maximum possible effect of an intervention, in gender ideal, ideal circumstances. So trying to detect whether and how large there is uh, any intervention effect when all uh, conditions have been optimized to detect that effect. The dramatic attitude towards trials that they described was that when trials are designed because they are seeking to inform a choice between feasible alternatives. Um, and this uh, particular exercise is then looking at uh, non-optimized and therefore real-world circumstances. So this difference of conceptual objectives 
leads the whole uh, uh, kind of cascade of sequences in terms of uh, how these studies are actually designed, the structural features of pragmatic explanatory trials. And Penny's going to talk in more detail about that a little bit later um, when we get to her portion. Uh, there are a bunch of terms common use that are not identical with but cl closely related to pragmatic or practical clinical trials is also a term in use. So um, we really have time to go into the nuances of how they are, how much overlap and how different they are, uh, how different they are. But uh, Richard Pito's model of large simple trials and mega trials, for example, the, the Gusta ISIS trials that were uh, implemented in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, practical clinical trials was uh, a term that uh, Carolyn Clancy and I and Dan Stryer used when we addressed this uh, concept in, the, um, in a, a JAM paper in 2003. Uh, David Sackett uses the term management trials, and other people have used the term effectiveness trials, real world trials, naturalistic trials, but, but all they're trying to get at some notion of uh, ruralness, typical circumstances, uh, how the risks and benefits of interventions uh, as they would, uh, you know, be used in outside of the um, uh, uh, idealized, uh, ideal uh, uh, situations and settings. So this is an interesting chart that we put together, which is looking at the number of uh, public articles in Medline by year that were application type of randomized controlled trial and use the term pragmatic or practical uh, in the title or the abstract. And see, there's kind of a relatively dramatic inflection point here sometime in the late 90s, early 2000s of, uh, you know, increasingly identifying uh, trials as being pragmatic or practical, randomized trials so fitting these terms. Um, you know, removed uh, any of my self-grandiose uh, delusions that my JAMA paper in 2003 really started this cascade. Um, but it also shows that, uh, you know, the uptake of the word pragmatic following the uh, Schwartz and Lelouch paper in 1967 was not particularly pronounced, but uh, there was there seems to have been some kind of uh, uh, transition to pragmatism in uh, in core research uh, that occurred, you know, about the last 10 or 15 years, and you know, so now we've uh, we seem to have a pretty strong trend towards um, a lot more uh, interest and activity in terms of at least trials being uh, uh, identified by by these terminologies. So let me uh, this transition rather abrupt, but let me just say I'll try to sort of make a link. A quick link between pragmatic clinical trials and comparative effectiveness research, or what is even more recently now being called increasingly patient outcomes research, which may be the same thing or may be somewhat different, but that remains to be debated. Um, so, uh, you know, to just kind of start from with the whole interest, uh, rapidly cr rapid crescendo of interest in comparative effectiveness research came from. It came from the results of numerous systemic reviews, which um, the results of which tended to be something, uh, some variation of what you see in this slide, which is uh, a kind of voluminous lack of evidence. If that's kind of contradictory, but in any case, uh, significant certainties on important and common clinical questions. In this case, is a kind of a um, a study of an evidence review. I think it was actually a draft uh, technology assessment uh, done by the Tufts EPC uh, from March of 2010. It was presented at a uh, uh, the uh, a meeting of the MedCAC, which is the advisory group that advises Medicare on coverage policy, radiation therapy for early stage prostate cancer. And basically, on the left, you see uh, you know various uh, <coughs> versions, you know various uh, variations uh, of uh, alternatives of, of radiation treatment. So this is radiation therapy versus no therapy or watchful waiting. Or now we call that active surveillance. Uh, sounds more active. 
This is stereotactic body radiation and external beam radiation. So that's the cybernite. This is high dose break therapy. Uh, then there's low dose brachytherapy. But whatever the comparison is, you see a uh, remarkable lack of, uh, of uh, evidence uh, uh, on the question of whether the outcomes are disease specific survival, free biochemical failure, or the toxicities. You know, the kind of a slight, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of evidence when you're comparing. Uh, then different versions of external beam radiation. So these are most likely studies of um, uh, IRT versus standard three-dimensional CRT or something like that. But there seems to be a little bit of evidence in this category. And so, um, what, uh, and to save time, I won't do another example. But the, you know, the paradox that this kind of highlights is that. Um, you know, every year there's about 18,000 new randomized trials and tens of thousands of other studies that have been published, and many, many, many systematic reviews, uh, meaning that the existing evidence is uh, inadequate, either non-existent, it's significantly methodologically flawed. But um, this is too consistent a finding to, you know, be the result of, uh, you know, accidental oversight. As I like to say, with you know, with 18,000 shots on goal, you'd kind of think that a few would go in occasionally just by accident. So, you know, it's just that there's uh, some sort of structural defect somewhere in the you know cascade of work that that is uh, carried out in the um, clinical and health services research enterprise. And then, if you look uh, as many of you spend your time doing at systematic reviews and that that sort of Characterize what the gaps in evidence are. You'll often see that it's uh, some of the concerns have to do with highly selected research subjects. Uh, settings are not typical of settings in which care is usually delivered. Yeah, uh, there's missing or incorrect comparators. Use too much reliance on surrogate or short-term outcomes as opposed to longer-term or functional outcomes. And um, the the sort of a fundamental premise. Comparative effectiveness research is that the gaps in evidence that are identified in systematic reviews that those gaps in knowledge will be reduced if there's greater engagement of end users in identifying what important uncertainties there are, specifying study questions, and crafting study protocols. The notion here is that uh, perhaps we would do a better job of answering critical questions if decision makers engage at the beginning of the research process rather than simply being the targets of dissemination efforts once all the research activity has been completed. So, you know, this is the question of how do we actually get, you know, patients, uh, uh, clinicians, and, um, and payers, these decision makers, involved in uh, prioritizing research, design study protocols, refining search questions, that's not a topic for another time. It's, you know, about sort of mechanisms of stakeholder engagement. But it's enough to know that core premise behind comparative effectiveness research and patient-centered outcomes research is we'll do more relevant research, more meaningful research, if decision makers are, are, are actively involved in the, you know, the early beginning stages of the research process. And that, of course, is, you know, uh, in what is the kind of official, at least currently official, mission statement of the core. Uh, this is a slide that Jeff Elby shows. The Patient Center Research Institute helps make people make informed healthcare decisions, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, uh, and then the last phrase that comes from research that's guided by patients, caregivers, and the broader healthcare community. So it's just reiterating what I said. This is now an entire institute that's committed to the notion that involvement of decision makers in the risk process is fundamental to generating the kind of knowledge that um, uh, is currently missing. And uh, sort of round that back out to where we started in terms of the definition of pragmatic clinical trials, um, see that you know, as Schwartzland and Luce put in their original paper in 1967, the whole of pragmatic clinical trials is that they, in choices between feasible alternatives, part of effectiveness research and patient-centered outcomes research are the objective is to help people make informed decisions. 
And that's all by saying that their pragmatic clinical trials are, by definition and intent, a fundal tool of comparative effectiveness research. Uh, they are, you know, their, their underlying fundamental premises are identical. So with that, um, let me just uh, sort of trace into Penny by saying that in the JAMA paper that on practical clinical trials that we wrote in 2003 with Carolyn Clancy and Dan Stryer, uh, this is a time when I was working at the Medicare program, and we were just, you know, struggling with the fact that the uh, systematic reviews that were provided to us to make Medicare coverage decisions have these, you know, worrying observations of deficiencies of research. At the time, then we 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 tried to talk about well, what would clinical trials look like that would be more useful for Medicare and by extension other decision makers, and so we identified these of clinical trials that would, would, in our view, help Medicare make more informed decisions, comparing clinical re clinically relevant interventions, so comparative, including a diverse study population, participants from a variety of settings, not just primary care, academic settings, you know, treated by specialists, and collecting data on a broad range of health outcomes. Um, which I think are still probably accurate ways of expressing characteristics of, of clinical trials, but a lot more thinking has been done since 2003 about the design features of pragmatic trials. And so Penny's going to uh, pick it up and start um, talking about that in more detail. So one of the things that I would like to underscore is a lot of times when people think about pragmatic clinical trials, they think about them as being a set separate beast or something completely different than a randomized controlled trial. But in fact, a pragmatic clinical trial is a form of randomized controlled trial. And that you can think about uh, the degrees of pragmatism as being on a um, uh, continuum from a more explanatory side to pragmatic side. A paper that we provide to you, I think uh, Liz, Liz provided this to all attendees that was written by uh, Kevin Thorpe and colleagues in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology in 2009 is a good illustration where he talks about the 10 various domains uh, designing trials and thinks about them in terms of uh, the extent to which they're explanatory or more um, pragmatic in um, various trial designs. The way this is presented is it's looked as a spokes of a wheel on um, with each of the 10 domains displayed around this wheel. It's a graphic tool to display the degrees of pragmatism. The further out from the center you are, the more pragmatic the clinical trial design. So this tool is really to help designers make explicit decisions about the importance of pragmatism in each of the elements of the trial structure. It is not to design a pragmatic trial just to be pragmatic, just not to have a, a trial that has incorporates all these elements as pragmatic as you possibly can, but in order to design a trial that's fit for purpose and make judicious decisions about which elements are most important specifically to the stakeholders. And as each one of these, the more you move outward on the line, the more you trade off internal validity for external validity, and that adds degrees of complexity, analytic complexity. This is another way to portray the information, which I think is a little bit easier to read than the slide that I gave you before. It shows you some of the domains of pragmatism that's in their tool. And it includes, for example, like an eligibility cr criteria is one of the arms of the of the tool, where a very broad population would be more pragmatic, and a very narrow population with a lot of inclusion criteria would be more explanatory. So intervention and flexibility. If you just if you have very strict control by protocol, that's more explanatory. But if you allow a great deal of flexibility for the practitioners to treat as they see fit then that is more pragmatic in design. And you can go through each one of these various domains and see um, which is more pragmatic and which is more explanatory. 
just provide you with a couple of illustrations in how this is used. When you go through each of the various spokes of the wheel and um, put points of where, whether it's more pragmatic or explanatory, you can trace out what's called a spider web. And this is an example using the trial called the PROMISE trial, which is a prospective multicenter imaging study for evaluation of chest pain. The trial that's currently underway has quite a few very pro pragmatic features. Let me see if I can use this pointer here. I'm a little bit um, new to this technology. If you look specifically, it's um, quite pragmatic in terms of eligibility criteria. It, um, in terms of uh, the settings of, of where it's going to be conducted, they're conducting 150 different sites. And so it's going to have a lot, a wide variety of settings and a wide, a fair broad population. However, it is all enrolling a fairly narrow age group. So it's, it lies in the mid ground there. Most critically, in terms of the interpretation of, this, of the scans for practitioner adherence, there's natural reading and interpretation of the scans. In fact, this trial is designed to show how um, computed coronary. Um, primary computed tomography and, um, and geography is used in practice as opposed to how it's used in ideal situations. This doesn't really answer the question of how the technology would be used if it was used by experts, but you could design a sub-study to answer that specific question. Just to do an example, Right. Just an example that sometimes trials with very explanatory features are the most optimal approach to generating evidence needed to inform clinical and health policy decision making. We can look at the diabetes control and complications trial. In this particular trial, there has very restrictive inclusion criteria and allowed little flexibility in, in treatment an experimental arm, but demonstrated very tight glucose control could have a dramatic effect in reducing microvascular outcomes, which is of great importance to patients and clinicians. At the time when this trial was, was completed, there was very little known about the efficacy of uh, tight glucose control. And this trial was very critical for informing decisions and could be considered to be quite pragmatic in fact in its end rate. A lot of questions about when do you use a pragmatic clinical trial, not a lot of consensus about this. Um, a lot of people, when they're thinking about comparative effectiveness research, commonly think that we're moving much more rapidly towards the use of observational studies. There are a lot of critical studies that potentially could only best be addressed with uh, randomization. And this is there's a real consensus about when to use randomization and when to use observational studies. And it's sub subjective and highly case specific. These are some of the criteria that uh, we discussed recently in a, a meeting that we hosted on developing a translation table and developing uh, the appropriate uh, approach to doing part of the effectiveness research, selecting the appropriate method for comparative effectiveness research for specific questions. What's clear about pragmatic clinical trials is they tend to be somewhat more expensive than, um, than observational methods. So you need to be quite specious in their use. There is probably best to reserve their use for situations when the risk of getting the answer wrong is very large, when there's a large impact on mortality or resource use or tree patterns. Also, it's important to, um, to use only um, when randomization is critical to getting a valid answer. And I think these are some of the dimensions where that could be the case when the prognostic variables are unclear biological process of disease is not well understood, and there's small anticipated differences in effect size, and selection bias could not be verbally controlled. Many of the channel challenges that are raised by 
um, implementing pragmatic clinical trials are the same challenges that are raised in randomized controlled trials in general. Difficulty, they, they're um, quite expensive, difficult to get a tight answer. There are complex regulations regarding preceding trial recruitment, require large sample sizes, excessive monitoring and data collection um, currently are in place, and there's complex trial procedures. The pragmatic design often can compound some of these issues, particularly when you have much larger trials and you have a research naive population or a um, uh, research naive group of practices that you're trying to implement the study in. So we we'll think of three particular areas that need to be improved um, in order to be able to um, a pragmatic clinical trials be more useful. The three is our enhancing structural and operational efficiency, improving analytic efficiency, and improving the relevance of trial design. Enhancing structural and operational efficiency is important to leverage existing networks, such as existing industries or potentially um, practice based research networks that are currently um, in use and supported by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Safety. Price research networks have allowed physicians to collaborate in community-based clinical research, and they've been used ex extensively as research laboratories, and standardized electric medical data collection by clinicians in practice and centralized oversight by ARC have allowed, um, expanded dramatically in, in uh, in the United States and have um, the quality of data has improved substantially. They're largely a rich and they're a very rich and largely untapped resource for the con conduct of pra pragmatic clinical trials. And while they've been used extensively for observational design, only a few random large scale control trials have been implemented within these networks and associated practices. Research expands outward to the community. Burdensome, there are burdensome consent procedures that, in particular, will be very difficult to, for busy physician practices to consider participating in, in pragmatic clinical trials. It's important to be able to think about how to streamline these consent procedures. There's a lot of work that's ongoing in the um, use of centralized web based training or central IRB. Potentially developing electronic interfaces as opposed to paper based tools to help with the informed consent process. Also, there have been a few cases of direct participant screening and informed consent that have been um, implemented. There's also a question about whether or not comparative effectiveness research requires a completely new paradigm for informed consent. That is, they're often comparing treatments that have been in use for a long time. And if you're implementing the pills within practice-based research networks or within um, large um, care systems that could potentially implement the changes very rapidly, really you have a learning healthcare system where the, the dividing line between the research and actual implementation and use is, there is a gray area. Potentially streamline and not necessarily need to have as um, um, <laughs> or as complex of, uh, of uh, um, informed consent procedures as currently are in place for trial or experimental treatment that have not been used in practice. Also, ground for there's room for improving the analytic efficiency of trials. Um, adaptive clinical lines are um, being adopted that could be potentially very useful in this setting. And linking pragmatic clinical trials with observational data sets can be useful too. We're currently in the process of working with the uh, University of Alabama and Birmingham in developing a trial in, in testing osteoporosis treatments that will randomize patients at the uh, pragmatic uh, um, practice-based research network level 
but then gather all the data in terms of the, the main interventions and also the um, looking specifically at the, uh, the major outcomes of, of fracture risk through care data. One of the major concerns that pragmatic clinical trials raises is treatment heterogeneity of treatment effects. This is because as you increase the diversity of um, people that are in the trial or settings of care, the patients respond differently to treatments being studied. And you, the heterogeneity of treatment effects can arise when there's uh, differences in patient's baseline treatment risk or genetic profile and disease severity among other factors. In some cases, treatment of heterogeneity um, uh, of treatment is beneficial, um, but also could be potentially that uh, treatment could be very harmful to a subset of the, of the trial population, particularly once side effects are considered. Okay, so just a, a couple more minutes just to finish up. Um, Basically, this section of the talk, we're talking about overcoming barriers to the implementation of pragmatic clinical trials, and we kind of identified three domains of these barriers. One, the operational efficiency. So we talked about, you know, the need to expand infrastructure for being able to readily uh, implement pragmatic trials, whether it's within the context of PBRNs or pre-existing registries, uh, uh, pre-existing research networks. The second area was the analytic efficient, efficiency, and we talked some about um, being in methods uh, and uh, improved methods for dealing with the heterogeneity of treatment effects. So that's um, on the analytic. So there's a, a methodologic agenda for improving the analytic efficiency. And the third area uh, that is uh, critically important to the success of being able to do uh, worthwhile and informative pragmatic trials is to be sure that they are relevant from the perspective of the decision makers. And so, as you might recall, at the beginning, I was really emphasizing how important it was that patients and clinicians and payers uh, be deeply involved in refining research questions, developing study protocols. And so, um, and obviously, that's critically important to the design of a pragmatic trial that's the results of which are going to be informative to those decision makers. And to give at least one example that sort of illustrates concretely what we learn from a decision maker's perspective that would influence and change the way trials are designed. And so, one example that I've uh, found quite interesting, which is a real study, was described uh, out of the United Kingdom from the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. And they were reviewing drug therapy for psoriasis. Uh, observed that the prior outcome reported in the most of the randomized trials. Uh, almost all of which were done for regulatory approval, used as their primary outcome uh, total body surface area affected by psoriatic plaque. Uh, so, was, uh, the, uh, so the measure was the extent of surface area, the thickness of the plaque, uh, uh, the scaliness of the plaque. And this is the validated primary outcome measure used in virtually all uh, trials. When they talk to patients, learn from the, those patients who have experience with this disease is that what really matters to them in terms of their quality of life is the severity of the involvement of their face and joints because that affects their, uh, you know, they look where they're exposed in public. It affects their, you know, use of their arms and legs. Um, and yet there is, has never been a developed and validated measure of facial joint involvement uh, for evaluating treatment. Uh, uh, for evaluating the comparative effectiveness of treatments for psoriasis. So if you wanted to do patient-centered outcomes research, or if you wanted to be doing a pragmatic, i.e. relevant to decision makers design trial, you would first have to develop, validate, and then use a outcome measure, either primary or secondary, that reflected the severity of facial and joint involvement because then you're really looking at outcomes that actually matter to patients in terms of what, you know, they care about in terms of the disease. So, you know, it brings in a whole, you know, raft of uh, implications in terms of, of uh, the uh, pathway to designing more relevant research 
and, and Pali, if you want to be doing pragmatic trials to inform decision making, is that we need to be more systematically consulting patients, as well as clinicians, and as well as payers um, about what some of their, um, uh, you know, what are some of the key considerations uh, from this perspective. And those beyond, of course, which is the appropriate primary outcome. Uh, uh, and uh, just to give a quick uh, additional example, and, uh, this is from uh, a case from a, um, a clinical line from the American College of Physicians on Drug Therapy for Alzheimer's Disease. Uh, in this case, the um, guideline uh, rated all of their uh, clinical recommendations in this guideline as weak. And one of the challenges that they pointed out was that there were no comparative studies that compared, uh, you know, different therapies uh, for Alzheimer's disease against each other. Um, that may not be a feasible thing to do, but it's certainly worth considering the perspective of the clinicians who are treating these patients and deciding what the most appropriate comparators would be. And then, you know, just to kind of go along with the previous example, um, the headline developers in this case pointed out that the one year of follow-up that was typical in the trials was sufficient given the natural history of the disease and, the, you know, the course of illness. And actually, currently, there has been more of an evolution in designing uh, Alzheimer's trials uh, the 18 months to two years at least, uh, partly because there is at least some imperfect feedback from the decision-maker community. So just to finish up then, um, you know, our premise is, is that for a subset of important comparative effectiveness research questions, randomization is going to be needed. And just as you apply randomization does not mean you have to abandon any hope of being able to do a study of external generalizability. And so pragmatic trials are really meant as, the, as, a, as an alternative to, I think, uh, to think the only approach to getting real-world effectiveness information is by doing non-experimental studies. Pragmatic trials tries to maintain experimental design where that's important, uh, but in features that enhance uh, generalizability and relevance. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, just to finish up, I think, an important tool, but for which there's a number of challenges that have to do with the operational infrastructure, the analytic uh, methodologies, uh, uh, managing the heterogeneity of, of treatment effects in these large uh, patient populations that are going to be more diverse. Uh, and then ensuring that their uh, uh, design is informed by the information needs of their uh, end audience. So that that's the kind of end of our prepared remarks, and uh, I think we have about 20 minutes or so for questions, and uh, I guess, Sebastian, maybe it would make sense for you to moderate. Absolutely. Uh, um, I, I will be moderating a little bit. So thank you very much, both of you, Sean and Penny, for this um, great uh, introduction to, to the issues um, and the cost of these studies. So that's really extremely valuable. Thank you very much. Uh, while others prepare their questions, maybe I have, I, I'll start out with one question, uh, which is, uh, it became clear during the presentation that uh, the, the terminology is, you know, there is no sharp separation between terminology here, it seems to me. The two examples that you showed at the end, which was about the choice of the right outcome measure, the choice of the most appropriate comparison. And that is where patient centeredness very much comes in. But is that pragmatic, or would other trials, traditional trials, could do that as well? Um, it's kind of fluent the terminology. Uh, where do you see the, the particular strength of what you see as kind of the core of um, the pragmatic trials or practical trials? Just to make sure I understand the question, you're pointing out that these, for example, the more relevant outcomes uh, could be included in, in efficacy or standard traditional explanatory trials. So the question is kind of what is uniquely valuable or distinctive about the pragmatic approach? Right. You, you formulated it a bit sharper. Now, I, I, I can't certainly see that. But if there, yeah, where would you see the, the, the best value of the, the unique value of uh, to call pragmatic trials rather than uh, making sure that you have the right outcomes in the most appropriate comparison groups in traditional randomized trials? Well, I think, you know, uh, things on that, and I don't know if it's a fully satisfactory answer, but the interesting thing when you actually go back to the language of the original Schwartz and Lelouch paper, 
The title of the paper was Explanatory and Pragmatic Attitudes Towards Randomized Clinical Trials. Mm -hmm. And they didn't invent a term called pragmatic clinical trials. It was an attitude. Mm -hmm. So how I would sort of address your question is, is that if you look at that practice instrument, the 10 domains of pragmatism, um, I think the value of the pragmatic attitude and the tool, the Precis tool, is that for trial designers uh, who want to be doing comparative effectiveness research or patient-centered outcomes research, be systematically going through each of those domains and making a conscientious decision about what is the right level of pragmatism given the question, given the decision maker, et cetera, and not defaulting to, which, which I think is part of the current problem, defaulting to considerations of, uh, you know, internal validity as always being the sort of the direction in which the default goes when making decisions about, about um, trial design. So, it, you know, we know that it, 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 more, it may be more informative for present clinicians and patients if, um, was conducted in community-based clinical practices rather than only enrolling expert clinicians with, who are highly experienced with the disease. And I think all we're promoting by with this concept is really that there should be a conscientious and deliberate process of going through each element of study design and trying to make it, arguing what the right level of pragmatism and to some degree if you want to be informing decision maker making, you make it as pragmatic as you possibly can along each of those domains, but no more so. Does that make sense? It makes great sense. I, I really, that was really helpful for me. Thank you. Um, any questions? Any questions? Um, well, we have one question here. Um, you, you, you want to read? Uh, we have a question from the audience that says, uh, what are the key components of a competitive grant for pragmatic trial in the era of decreased funding? Using registries and Zoom data can reduce these costs, but these types of trials can be expensive. Uh, so, what are the key components of for for being a, for a competitive? Uh, you know, how are you going to successfully get a uh, a like trial funded? I guess this is the question, right? That's fundamentally it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, you how know, to make knew, to Corey? Yeah, if I had a perfect answer to that question, I'd be a lot richer than I am today. So uh, let me offer what I think are a couple of um, uh, you know, just, uh, kind of initial thoughts on this. One is I think the issue of uh, operational efficiency and, and taking advantage of existing infrastructure and to use as a platform for pragmatic trials would be incredibly important because Trying to set up an infrastructure from scratch and doing a grant proposal around that strikes me as, uh, you know, a long shot or, you know, a much higher, a much um, smaller lift than if one could, for example, partner with uh, uh, DartNet or the practice-based research networks, uh, as Ken Sag is doing with some of his osteoporosis work. There, there might be opportunities to uh, collaborate with Rich Platt and the Sentinel folks who have this huge network of, uh, you know, administrative data that could possibly be used for recruiting patients from community-based settings. So I would say a key thing would be, um, uh, you know, thinking creatively about using existing infrastructure. I guess another one I left out was, uh, um, you know, existing large existing national registries would seem like an, an ideal platform upon which to do, uh, supposed to do pragmatic uh, trials. Another thing which I think is, uh, you know, Bastion, maybe this is not fair play, but uh, it's redirecting a question back to you, which is we make a fairly strong case about why you really need to be doing a pragmatic trial. In other words, why you need to be retaining randomization rather than using the most advanced methodology of analyzing you know, observational non-experimental data. And to some degree, and Sebastian, I don't know if you're prepared to weigh in, but you know that seems to be a critically important 
line to distinguish is where in what for what clinical questions, for what CER questions, you'd want all the trouble and expense of figuring out how to do a pragmatic trial versus um, you know, putting all of your effort into a non-experimental uh, design. So I think it relates to the question that was just asked, so I'm just kind of deflecting it back to you, really. Well, I would like your terminology, the, the pragmatic aspects of trials, or pragmatic aspects of research almost, even broader, right? And they become increasingly important, certainly with PCORI, um, as I had kind of mentioned already with, with the outcomes, the relevant outcomes, the relevant comparison groups. Uh, the key aspect is when you say pragmatic trial, you have already decided that you want to randomize. You want to have some sort of baseline randomization. Um, but these are all um, aspects of research in general that have have to be considered and you have to trade them off against each other depending on what you want. So as what Sean was already saying is it, you have to be very, very clear what you want to study, what kind of answer you want, to, what type of answer you want to get. So which is where the stakeholder involvement, of course, comes in and patient being one important stakeholder in this whole thing. Um, but just verifying what you want and then fit the right research to that with a very pragmatic approach. Uh, it's, it's just key, and I'm basically just reiterating what you have said in different words. Any other questions? Oh, here's another question. Liz has another question. We have another question from the audience asking if you could comment on the multiplicity issues with multiple outcomes in a diverse population with possible multiple subgroups. Um, this, is, this is Penny. John is actually. Um, just to another call, but he will be back in, in just a little bit. But I think I think it is important to include um, multiple outcomes that are of importance to users and to decision makers. But that, um, there needs to be in, in multiple population groups. One needs to be very clear at the very beginning to um, to select a few, two or three subgroups of populations that you have strong um, right now for why you think there might be uh, different uh, treatment effects in those, in those groups. And uh, in terms of the analytic approaches to multiplicity of outcomes, I'm going to have to defer to other experts in this field. I want to remind people, uh, the, the audience, of the, the um, lecture that we had, the webinar by Ken Rothman, who talked about multiplicity and how to deal with that, how to address uh, these issues. So it is a fairly generic issue. It's not specific to today's lecture. Any other questions? And I think everyone's unmuted, so you can, I think, just speak into the, the telephone or the microphone, whatever you have. Hello. Um. This is Stacey Dusina, uh, the Department of Healthcare Policy at Harvard. I have a question about how pragmatic trial results from some of the trials that have been completed have been adopted, and whether there's been any uh, effort to really quantify whether these results have been used. Uh, in particular, I guess I'll mention two studies. One, the one that's mentioned in um, the JAMA article about the all hat trial and how there was a finding that the inexpensive diuretics were considered to be um, better than the other options. Uh, the second being the KD trial, which looked at um, the comparative effectiveness of antipsychotics and showed that the older uh, generation antipsychotic was performed near as well as some of the other second generation um, antipsychotics on safety and perhaps as well on efficacy, and whether there have really been any efforts to quantify whether results from these large expensive trials have been adopted by... Um yeah, so the, the two that you mentioned, I, there's, there's only been a long um, debate and discussion, and there's a lot of, of uh, other about how they have not been adopted, as well as I, I think the Accord trial is, is another example of that, to in the area of, of uh, diabetes. Um, I can say that, that the, um, I think this again gets back to the question, there, there's definitely a gulf between when um, the evidence is 
um, um, which one wants to say, is compelling enough um, for, for practice to change as well. And I think that when I think about some of the trials that have had huge impacts on, on uh, clinical practice, the diabetes um, complications and troll trial, as well as um, one trial that I, I refer to a lot is the National Emphysema Treatment Trial, had dramatic effects on, uh, on patient practice. So I think, again, this is, this is looking back at, at making sure that you target, um, target pragmatic trials to those questions that are of um, potentially really high impact on the population, too. I think part of the difficulty with the um, all hat was it took such a long time for the trial to be completed, and we have to increase the speed at which these trials are being done. Any more questions? We actually had another question from the audience to follow up on Sean's comment earlier to Sebastian. To what extent can an observational study be seen as a limiting case of a pragmatic trial, and where consideration needs to be given to where you need to randomize and where issues of confounding are not necessarily important? So that, um, something to refer to, I'm going to go back up to this particular slide that I have here. Um, again, I think that it, it's it's the context specific. It has um, a lot of uh, it depends very much on the research question that that you're answering and uh, uh, you're trying to answer, and you need to be very very crystal clear in, uh, in developing that research question from the beginning. And depends a great deal upon the available data to have in order to be able to um, understand uh, the outcome of the question, but um, that if are potentially again it's very subjective about selection bias and when or when that cannot be reasonably controlled. But if you're facing a data set that really does not have a lot of the the data that, that necessary in order to um, uh, potentially identify um, selection bias, then that's clearly one where you would want to to randomize or um, even. Um, is, is, some situations where the biologic process of disease is really not well understood, for example, in the area of, of wound care um, and healing wounds, it's um, very difficult to, to quantify what you need to quantify. Um, so. All right, any more questions? When I went into this phone conference, I thought I, I would ask you about the costs for these trials. But now realizing this is a question that is not answerable because it so much depends on the specific setting, what, what you're seeing, and uh, what kind of existing data or generating mechanisms you're linking to, right? And uh, you emphasize this quite a bit that you want to uh, always consider linking to existing research uh, networks because through that you will have a mechanism to A, recruit patients, and B, uh, a, a mechanism to identify events and validate events, right? So, absolutely, and and I think there there's a, a nice study that was done by Academy Health that was looking at the the cost of uh, of uh, clinical trials as opposed to observational studies and showed a, a large difference. But I think that that in and of itself is not looking at the potential efficiencies that are to be gained by utilizing some of these networks that are in place. Question from the audience. Um, I, I don't see any more questions coming up here, so last chance for anybody to speak freely in the microphone or type in your question. Sebastian, please, Harrington. I'm thinking about, yeah, I'm at Kaiser Permanente, and I'm thinking about you know, wonderful resources here and how we have such aspirations to use these in the future to generate evidence. 
I'm, I'm picturing a time when providers uh, understand what we're asking them to do sufficiently that recruit patients um, request, uh support to research staff and could be done with some automation perhaps and uh, with providers being engaged in a kind of learning environment. I wonder if you could uh, provide some operations for us. Where will we be in 10 years in terms of using uh, health information technology and a more sophisticated cadre of physicians, a more um, a linked together set of researchers and physicians to generate evidence using these methods? Uh, I definitely see very rapid innovation in, in this area, and I'm hoping that we can continue to support that same pace of change in, in the future. I think there's a lot of investment in the infrastructure that needs to happen for, before we get there. Um, I, I mentioned the specific trial that we're working on with the University of Alabama where it's a, it's a fairly simple design where you randomize patients within a, a physician's practice and then you link it to the, the Medicare data. And if you enrich that data with a, um, electronic health record, so you could potentially have a very powerful uh, infrastructure for d conducting randomized trials. Right. Uh, but then then I, I could almost argue, if you're entirely relying on, on these networks to just collect the data, anyways, collecting, you're not changing anything, you're basically working with secondary data. So the only difference to a secondary database analysis then is the baseline randomization. I don't want to minimize that. Of course, that is important in many settings. Uh, but that, that just underlines the... The, the fluent uh, transition from observational research from, of, of secondary data uh, to randomized research of secondary data to randomized research with primary data collection, it's, it's all one continuum, right? Absolutely. Right. Right. So I, I don't see any more questions. So uh, again, I want, want to thank uh, Penny and Sean for, for their wonderful presentation.